Well, good evening, and welcome back to our study from the book of Exodus. We saw last week in chapter 14, the Lord saves the Israelite people from the Egyptian army by way of a miraculous crossing of the sea and an equally miraculous collapse of the sea upon the Egyptians. The first part of chapter 15 is a song of praise to the Lord for his deliverance. The ending of that song, sung by the Israelites, says, The Lord will reign forever. The question we'll see today is whether or not the people believed that statement. Look at Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 through 27. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur, they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, they named it Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. And then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. After the crossing of the sea, after the destruction of the Egyptians, the people traveled for three days. Remember that three days before what we just read, the people sang, The Lord will reign forever. So, when we get to this part, what was their problem? Three days after they sang, the Lord will reign forever, they ran out of water. And they've come to a source of water, which for some reason is undrinkable. It says it's bitter. Rather than calling on the Lord who reigns forever, the people begin to complain. Moses brings the complaint to the Lord, who provides a, a simple yet elegant solution. How did the Lord solve the problem? He says, add this particular log, a certain unnamed tree, we don't want to know what it was, add that to the water, and the water becomes drinkable. The solution was there all along. All the people should have done was ask rather than complain. Then the Lord explains how this new relationship is going to work. The Lord basically says, listen and do. Listen to what I command you. Give ear to the rules, the statutes. Do what is right in God's eyes and keep the rules. God makes a promise attached to this statute. Do this and nothing bad, nothing like happened to the Egyptians, will happen to you. And then God says, part of his name is, God is your healer. God's setting out the ground rules. God says, I will be God and take care of you. You be my people and do what I say. This seems simple, perhaps too simple. But is this not also the basis for our relationship with God? The, the first important, the first and most important part of, of our relationship with God is recognizing that God is God. That, that means we understand, we recognize who He is, and, and in the same way, who we are in relationship to Him. Uh, the joke, God is God and you are not. Well, that seems obvious. 
And, and we're to show that God has these things in hand, or and to show that, God moves the people again. This time he moves them to a place where there are 12 springs of water and one for each of the tribes. God is showing these people that he has all things under control. Let's keep reading. Chapter 16, verse 1. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, not wilderness that caused them to sin, that was the name, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now again, the, the people are on the move. They're moving slowly toward the mountain of God, the mountain where Moses encountered God in the burning bush, the mountain where God established Moses as his spokesperson. It tells us that in total, the people have been traveling for about a month, and, and all the time travelers, long distance travelers particularly, they're going to know that at some point they're going to need to resupply. And that's the situation here. The, the people are running out of food. And, and once again, what we see here is the people, they, they don't seek a solution from the Lord. They don't even make a request of the Lord. They just go back to grumbling. They complain. And, and they, make a, they make a ridiculous statement. Did they really think that Moses had led them into the wilderness to starve to death? That's the reason for leaving Egypt. Have you brought us here to kill us, they ask. What were they thinking? God could have killed them if that was the point. God could have killed them in Egypt. Rather than the Egyptians who died, God could have ended their slavery with a plague exclusive to Israel wiping Israel out. He didn't do that, and they knew that. But what they're demonstrating is a lack of faith. As we look at this, their, part of their complaint is that they used to sit by meat pots. They used to eat bread to the full. Did they really? These people were slaves. Everything about their lives would have been monitored, probably dictated to them. They were only allowed to eat what they were provided. If they had meat at all, it was probably because the Egyptians knew that they needed the meat, the protein, for strength in order to work them more. If they were ever full, it would have been somewhat surprising. Part of the problem may have been that they were provided for by the Egyptians. They didn't need to fend for themselves or worry about whether or not they would have food. They grew up with Egypt's rule. Now they've been given a little bit of freedom, and they long for what they had. They want the good old days. But those were days of labor. Those were days of slavery. Those were days of crying out to the Lord in despair. They seem to have forgotten all of the hardships of the past. And they're missing what is right in front of them by constantly looking back. Look at verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? God, once again, hears their complaints. They're not simply going to get food. God says it's going to 
rain food, bread from heaven. God knows their need. God knows where they are. God knows how many of them there are. God will provide bread from heaven. Every day they will have enough to eat. Every day they will have enough for that day. God will provide food for them. Now that's the most obvious reason for the provision of the bread from heaven. As far as their hungry stomachs are concerned, physical food will meet their need. But there's also a spiritual element, a spiritual reason for this bread from heaven. The Lord says, this is going to be a test. The Lord says, I will provide. Will they be faithful? There's some specific instructions given in this passage about the bread from heaven. Every day, the people will have the opportunity to go out and get enough food for that day. Every day, they're to prepare what they will eat that day. Every day, but the sixth day. On the sixth day, they're to gather enough and to prepare enough for two days. Now, at this point, they don't know the reason for the, the two-day preparation versus the each-day preparation, but that, too, is going to be a part of the Lord's provision for the people. We'll talk about that next week. They complained to Moses and Aaron. But Moses says to them from the Lord, this evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Now, was that not obvious to the people? Did they actually think it was Moses? Did they not see the sea part and then collapse back on the Egyptians? Did they not know that no man, not even a man as impressive as Moses, no man could do such a thing? Sometimes, like them, we need reminders. They should have known. They should have known this, too, that it, it says in the morning you're going to see the glory of the Lord. They should have known that already. Again, the miracles should have been enough for them to have said, we have seen the glory of the Lord. They, if they'd even looked up, if they had just looked up and seen the, the pillar of cloud, unless it was dark, and the pillar of fire at night, they would have seen the glory of the Lord. Moses asked the question, what are we, meaning he and Aaron, what are we that you should attribute your discomfort to us? That's another implication in this also. He, he says, what are we that you should attribute your provision to us? We're not doing this. God's doing this. Sometimes we're like these people. Oh, maybe not manna from heaven, but we see the, the miracle of life in a newborn, the beauty of creation in a sunrise, or the splendor of God in a mountain range or a sunset. And yet we, we sometimes doubt God's provision for us. God's provision, like it was for these people, God's provision for us can be a test. It was for them. It, can be for us. God was giving them all that they needed, all that was necessary to believe and have faith. In fact, more than enough. But would they have faith? Would they have enough faith after all of God's provision to believe that God would take care of them? Do we? Do we believe with all of God's provision and blessings for us? Do we believe that we can trust his guidance? Do we believe we can trust his leadership, his word? Yeah. We know from history that these people, well, they failed the test. We should pray that we'll learn from their example and do better. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this encouraging word today. We, we see your provision. Oh, it was real. It was physical. It was visible right in front of them. And now, 
it's about to be edible. Your provision for these people is going to result in, in actual food, things that they can not only see, but things that they can, can touch and can eat. You've provided for them in a miraculous way, and you ask of them trust and faithfulness. Lord, we know you've provided for us in a miraculous way, and you ask from us trust and faithfulness also. Help us to learn the lesson that these folks, well, that they missed. Help us to learn to trust. Help us to learn to believe and know that you will provide for us no matter our circumstance, no matter where we find ourselves, what desert we find ourselves in, even if it's one of our own making, that we can trust you to provide, to see the best for us, and to make a way. We know, Father, that that best way, according to your word, is Jesus. And so we pray that you would help us to have complete faith and confidence, complete trust in Jesus as our Lord, the one that guides our lives, as our Savior, the one that provides eternity for us. Father, we pray that you would help us to, to trust and obey, to listen and to do and to have faith, especially to have faith when we see things not working out the way we expect them to or not even the way we want them to. Uh, Father, we know that illness is a part of the corruption of this life due to sin. And when we see loved ones that are sick, we, we pray, Lord, that you would work out their best for them, that they, would, uh, that they would trust and believe in you, that you'd give us the trust also that we need for this life, this broken, corrupt world that we live in. Father, we pray for those that are suffering with coronavirus again, or maybe for the first time, but we thought we were about over it. Now it's come back. We pray, Lord, for those that we know that are suffering, both here in our neighborhood and family members are in the, around the country. We pray your blessing there, that, that they would take advantage of the things that would be necessary for recovery, submitting to the doctors, submitting... Lord, to the, the treatments that are there. We pray for wisdom for the doctors to use the available treatments to help them get better. We pray more than anything that even in sickness, we would trust you. And we ask that you would provide for us as you provided for Israel just each day what we need for that day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.